Well, thank you everyone for, for making the time and coming to hear this presentation. My goal is to share what we've learned over, like this is five years now and continuing to, to go, where we've been testing and doing research on government websites. Typically it's local government. Um, we have done work with some universities and we're also doing a little bit now state level. But my name is Chuck and I'm a user experience manager. I run a usability lab, and then in my abundant free time, I'm also an ethics lecturer in computers. So it makes for a very interesting life. So if you want to get into an ethics debate later, I'm down for that. If you want to talk about this stuff, we're good to go. But I kind of want to give you an idea of what we're going to cover. And this is really based on our findings in the field. So there may be some things that are kind of, you know, you're going to say, duh, I, I know this already, you don't need to tell me. But what I'm trying to reflect back to you is this is what we've been hearing from people, and this is our observation after talking to a lot of people over time. And so the big question that I would be asking is, you know, what makes me know anything at all? What have we done to gather this information? What have our data sources been? And so over the past couple of years, we've been running what are called intercept surveys. And so that will just ask someone when they land on a page and they're about to leave, were you able to find what you were looking for? Or we'll ask them, what did you come here today to do? Because sometimes there are web pages that exist and no one knows why they exist, which seems kind of strange to me. You know, the act of creating something, usually there should be some sort of purpose behind the thing. But a lot of you may have had this experience where there's a site with thousands upon thousands of pages, and you can see who the creator was. You know the date the thing was created, but no one else knows why this page existed. It's kind of this relic of time. So we've run a lot of intercept service and collected data and then coded that. We've also done usability testing. So we're up to above 25 people now that we've had come in and do individual sessions in the lab and have them walk through and find out what they're interacting with and if they're having any problems as they're going through a site. We've also done surveys. And so this is across a lot of different cities and counties. And we generally ask the same questions for each survey. So it means that we've been able to standardize a lot of this data. We've also been able to pull analytics from these sites. And we have over a million at this point visits. And we then went out and said, OK, let's make sure we know what we're looking at. Can we independently vet some of these things? So what are people actually visiting? What are the top 10 pages? What are the top 20 pages that we're seeing people access on a regular basis? And it turns out that the things that we were seeing were matching up with what the third parties were seeing. So we feel pretty good about this. We know where people are going on sites, and we have a pretty good idea of what they're doing. But the, the big thing here is, you know, what have we actually learned? What is it that we've been able to derive from this? And this is the first kind of duh moment for you. So we know that government is very different, but it's different in very unique ways. Because we also do usability testing and do research work for a lot of other types of industry. So we work with e-commerce, work with nonprofits. And what we find is that government has challenges that no one else has. And I would be remiss if I didn't include some Leslie Nope in here. <laughs> but here are the big differentiators. Pressure from elected officials. No other organization that we've ever worked with has to deal with things being swapped out on the homepage so that they can have their face there. Other organizations are generally concerned about, are users able to accomplish the task they came here to accomplish? And so that's the number one thing. For e-commerce, they're trying to sell things. It's very focused. You are trying to optimize that experience specifically. And so for other companies, they're also in verticals of, of you know, sharing information, let's say Facebook, Instagram. You're focused on sharing information and reading through content. So you're trying to interact with that content. So they can optimize around that. But I've seen where a government official elected will have things swapped out where we had common tasks that people were trying to accomplish on the site. So we wanted those you know, front and center so it would be easy for them to get to where they're going. And it was swapped out with content for electeds. And it's just not something you typically see anywhere else. The other thing that kind of makes this interesting is you've got these multiple levels of management. And it means that we've seen where you may have one phone call change a web page entirely. And so the web page was actually working just fine. It was doing what it was supposed to do, but you have one person out of tens of thousands who said, I couldn't find the thing. And that caused pressure to then change the usability 
the overall usability of this page to then switch it so that it's now less usable for 9,000 other people. And so it's one of these things where I feel that we need good data. So we need to say, when someone comes to us and says, hey, we need to change this, we can say, oh, we shouldn't, and here are this reason why. I thank you for the feedback, but let's see what we can do to, to work this out and evaluate this change. And this is where we also see from departments and managers, because I've noticed that department directors and directors overall will have different concerns. Because when we've done kind of goal setting workshops with directors, what we found is they're really concerned about how their department is appearing outside in kind of the rest of the world. So they want to know that they're being put forward in the best light possible, and they want their staff to be put forward in the best light possible. But sometimes that means putting news stories or jamming communications up above the common links or the common tasks that people are trying to find. And so you've got kind of these competing interests, because most of the people then who are actually working with the website, they're concerned about the problems that people are facing, that they're hearing about, that they know about, and they're trying to fix those. So it's kind of like you're trying to take this feedback from elected, you're taking feedback from one person who's very upset about a specific set of interactions, and then you've got different departments, different ideas, and different things that they find important. And then the last one that I think drives everyone a little bit crazy is people just start to stuff things on the site and say, well, it's on the site. I, I have it up there. And the assumption is that Google is just going to magically solve the problem. I mean, Google is the greatest search engine the world has ever seen, can find a lot of things. But we're finding that there are intranets, so those still exist, but more and more things are being put into department pages where maybe it's not something that's important for actual people that we're serving, maybe it's more of something being shared within the department, but instead that content's being added. And it means that managing the content gets really difficult. And what we've seen developing is People will kind of keep going until the site is about to fall over. And then there's this big process to go out to bid, do RFPs, everything else, and then nuke the site, start all over again, and the same thing happens. It seems like we have the same behavioral issues related to content within websites. And it doesn't matter where you are. It just keeps happening like this. So during these intercept surveys we run, we get people telling us whether they could find information kind of yes, no. And 99.9% .9 of the time, the thing actually is somewhere on the site. So we know that it's there, but we know that less than 70% of the time can people actually find the thing. And so we run this little thing, it pops up, it says, were you able to find what you were looking for? And we generally get right around 70, just a little bit below. Sometimes we get up as high as 80, but we never reach anything above 80%. Number one, if there's teenagers who access the site, they're really annoying and they're never satisfied with any web interaction. Just note that. It's rough. So reading through feedback today for a history museum that has, it's a state history museum that has educational info, and the students have to go online and find some of that. They're very displeased. But, what this means for us is we know that the 70% mark, if we're falling down into 60, 50, 40, we know there's something seriously wrong with this page. People have also gotten really impatient. So we've noticed over the years that people expect content faster and they don't want to scan, they just want it right there. And so we have had them say that the information was not on the page when it's there and it's in you know 24 point right there in front of them. And this is important to remember because you may have people come in and complain about something and say they can't find specific content. The content may actually be there and it may have actually been very visible, but it doesn't mean that everyone's going to be satisfied with the speed of finding content on a site. We can't hit 100%. As much as we've tried, we've seen this with usability testing, we don't get to 100%. We try to get as close as possible, but we can't quite get there. The other big thing, and I want everyone just to think about this, is that people are trying to accomplish tasks. That's why they're there. So they want to pay that bill, they want to find that particular piece of information, and their life is happening offline, or online in some cases, but not on that site. And so one of the main rules of usability has been for a long time, you know, people spend most of their time on someone else's site, and it's true. So they're task-based, they want to get that interaction complete, and then they want to move on to whatever it is else that they'd like to do. But it's important to remember this because they're not just browsing. They're not kind of following a path to find information unless it's based on them trying to specifically get 
to a goal or to solve some problem that they have. So this is one thing that is, uh, it's frustrating because during usability testing, if they can't interact with the navigational items, they'll jump into search, figuring, well, search solves all problems. Google's magic. And it, it doesn't really work like that. So over and over again, we're finding that as people are trying to find what they're looking for within the site, they're going up to that initial site search, typing it in. Or they're coming to Google, and you better hope that you've got all the stuff updated. You've got your right meta tags, meta title, everything else, because they're using Google. They're backing out of the site. And from my perspective within the industry that I'm in, it's made it really hard to do usability testing because we do usability testing based on the person being on the actual website. But what we found is that they're bouncing back and forth between Google. If they don't find it on the site, they'll then bounce out to Google. They'll then bounce back into the site and then they'll try to use a site search and if that doesn't work, they'll go back out to Google. So it's kind of this back and forth and it means it's really important and more important than ever that number one, get, get the site search thing addressed. Um, the basic search that comes with a lot of sites just doesn't seem to have enough horsepower. And we're finding that people's perception is that it really should be like Google. And it never is like Google. A lot of the search appliances have kind of moved by the wayside now, and it's been frustrating to see that. But know that site search, and go through it. What I would do is I would look at analytics and see what are people actually searching for, find out what are the frustration points where they can't find the thing in the menu items, and have that help also guide decisions around navigation. So what we found, if the menu items are unclear, they go to search. It used to be a last resort thing, but now it's moved up in the priority of what interactions they're doing. A lot of times the metadata is not useful, and so they can't rely on that, which means we can't rely on Google search to, to find it. There's a lot of documents that end up being duplicated over time, or they'll have slight revisions, or they'll be uploaded multiple times to the same site because different departments, different groups are using them. And this makes it difficult to sift through that content. And that means that you don't have necessarily a real source of truth because you could have a form that has five different versions. Someone fills it out, but they filled out the wrong one. And they have no way of knowing. We can't, we can't fault the user for that. And so some of these are, are surprising to us, may not be as surprising for you guys, but news. It's this fascinating thing that we're seeing where more people are looking for certain news items within the government website. And we, we have some theories as to what's happening here. We know that you know, overall there's been a decline in local newspapers. Which means a lot of times it gets kicked back to people who are working within local government to provide that information. So if there's a construction project happening, if Public Works is doing something, or anything's going on, newspapers aren't writing about it. It's now up to government to write these press releases and, and get them out so that people know what's happening. And then we're seeing people coming to the site and getting more news from a government website, which is kind of fascinating to us because it's not something that we saw five or six years ago. And normally the thing we see at local government level is everyone wants to know what's happening locally. They want to know what's happening to them in their neighborhood or on the way to their commute or where they drive commonly. So people are trying to find out news that impacts them. <coughs> okay, there's construction happening. Oh, what is the construction? What, what's being built? What's going on here? And this is one of those areas where we see expectations not necessarily matching up with people understand what government's role is, where we've had people tell us at community events that they want to have a list of every permitted project by every address so they can just go look it up real quick and have pictures and know exactly what's happening, which is normally the role of the marketing person at the development company if it's a private bid. So this is the other surprising one, but calendars. We've been surprised at the number of people who are coming to government websites and wanting to find out more about events. And again, this is very much more oriented towards local government, but I don't know if there's kind of a vacuum now for people being able to find what's happening, but this isn't for finding necessarily government-based events either. We found it correlates really heavily, of course, with Parks and Rec. 
So if there's a Parks and Rec department within that organization, you're going to see people looking for events because Parks and Rec does a lot of events. But the other thing that people are looking for, and we've been getting feedback around, is they want to post community-based events. They want to appear on the calendar. And so they want their events up there, and they want more of an open calendar. And it's been this kind of interesting development because we, we haven't seen this before, really. And I don't know if anyone does that out there, but they're, they're asking for this. They want to be able to have their events appear and post them on the city calendar. And it's just been kind of a surprise for us because we haven't really thought traditionally or seen traditionally people looking for kind of events from the government, but that's now what they're trending towards a little bit. And we see it, it's a smaller percentage. So if we kind of go through and look at these findings, it's a smaller percentage of people, but it's significant enough that we need to talk about it. I think this is like our overall classic finding. People don't know very much at all about government. And it's actually quite terrifying to me because I think democracy is great and I really love it. And it's almost as if we need civics lessons to be maybe provided at schools. I don't know. But people don't know much at all about government. And it's to the extent that they don't know. So if you go to any kind of local area, what we found is that they don't know who's fulfilling what roles. So who do I need to call about X? And so they will call everyone but who they need to call. The other thing, when I was mentioning that we can't get to 100% with those surveys for the intercepts, you can't get to 100% if you don't do the thing. So if the information is not available because you literally don't do it, and people are saying no, it creates this really interesting vacuum, I feel. Because we see it with cities and counties a lot, where the county does this thing, and the city does this thing. And people will be complaining because they're looking for the information on the city site, but the county has it. And so the question starts coming up, you know, should we just create a page and just kick them right over to the county and say, hey, you know, we're getting a lot of these things. And, and we've done this in the past. We've recommended it where we've had issues with, I mean, all sorts of things. So just put a page on the site, and it's going to kick over to this different entity, but just get them right over there. That way, you put it there, you just kind of nip in the bud, and people will stop complaining because they're calling you. They're complaining about this, and it's not even within your world. It's not within your jurisdiction. And what we know about behavior for users on sites is that they're perpetual intermediates. And hopefully you guys can see this. But people want to move up to this intermediate status. So they start off as beginners, where they're really just learning how things work. But what we tend to do is we design either for beginners or experts, and we never end up designing for the intermediates. So think of your experts as your power users. And think of the beginners when you're designing for this. Think of it as you know, the kind of the, the big Tinker Toy setup websites where giant buttons, you know, click here now. And on the expert side, think about someone who's you know, using the terminal or the command line. They know exactly what they're doing. And this is what happens if you have developers design a site. They design on the expert side. If you have marketers design a site, they design it on the beginner side. The truth, of, truth is most people are in the middle. And people strive to get moved up a little bit because they want to understand more, they're trying to learn, but you've got to bring them along the way. <coughs> so overall, what have we found that people are doing? So this is derived from going through analytics and then grabbing third party analytics and ranking everything and seeing where it all ended up. <laughs> so permits, this is one of the top things, which makes sense. I mean, this is one of the main things that kind of we're fulfilling or providing to people. But what we don't know, and this is partially because how websites are structured, um, how the data is organized, we know that they're going to a page about permits. But that's all we know. We can make assumptions that they're trying to find the status of a permit. They're trying to apply for some sort of permit. They're trying to get information about permits. 
But we know that, I mean, this is one of the primary functions we see with City and County. They're going for permits. But again, it's kind of this black box for us because we can only see up to the point where they get to permits. And then since every site is a little bit different, the interactions aren't the same, and even the different permits provided aren't the same, it means it starts to differentiate. And so we can't kind of track it after that. But we know that this is one of the essential functions. People are coming here. A lot of times we see that behaviorally, they know where to go. If it's a first time permit, it really changes the dynamic. They get more frustrated. But if it's someone who's regularly interacting, they know where to go. They kind of have made the adjustment. They go directly to the correct area of the site and then go through. The other thing that we found is there's been this proliferation of third party solutions to everything. So we also have kind of this black box where we can't see what happens on the third party side. So as soon as they leave and click that link and go to the portal, we don't know what happens from there and we can't assess usability of it or get any info. The other one is just the number of people who are getting information from or about police. So we have to assume that what we're seeing is non-emergency type calls. This could be an emergency call. I'm not wasn't sure how to classify it. But we see a lot of people going to just the police department homepage. And we don't know if it's just kind of, hey, I want to make you know, a non-emergency complaint or want to have a conversation about something or just learn more about the police department. But we see a ton of traffic going to police department pages. And so it's been really interesting to us because we don't get feedback through the feedback collectors related to this. We get it related to everything else. And I don't know if maybe just the police pages have just made it really easy to use. Maybe it's that they're saying, hey, if it's an emergency, call 911. If you want to report something that's not an emergency, call this number or fill out this form. But so far, we've seen this heavy traffic and we don't have insight into what's happening. Why are so many people visiting police pages? And this kind of goes across the board for sites. It's been kind of surprising. It's always within the top 10 most visited pages. You can hide this jobs link like anywhere. You can make it the same color text as the background. People will find this. So no matter what. And don't let the analytics fool you because we had a director once suggest that we put jobs as one of the top things. We said, no, you don't want to do that. There's people looking for jobs and then there's everyone else. And the people looking for jobs, let's provide a link for them. Usually now it's in kind of the, either the header and kind of the global utility area or it's in the footer, but a ton of traffic. And this is across the board for, for all sites. It's not just government based. Anytime we look at a site and look at the analytics, jobs will be one of the top 10 things that people are looking for. And so this is just one of the few ones that I have that's like universally true that we see. And I thought this was kind of clever because I've never seen anything like this. So if anyone is actually from Miami Beach, kudos. We always have issues with people not understanding what, what departments do based on their name. And sometimes it's because maybe tax and licensing doesn't do all of the licensing. Maybe they only do licensing for some segment. Or within public works, people don't typically know what a public work is. They know that there's an entity called public works if they visit the site, but it's not really in their kind of conscious. They don't think about it. And what this kind of leads to, and why I thought this was such a clever little gif here, it walks through all of the cool things that Public Works is doing. And again, I've never seen this before. Like, this is the simplest way of saying, hey, we do a whole lot of stuff. But usually we're really bad about, you know, showcasing this type of information. It's more generally you land on a page with a whole bunch of links. You've got to find your way through it to figure out what you're trying to get to. And the other kind of maddening thing that we found is department structures differ everywhere. And so there's not a lot of 
standards or consistency. There's, there's some, but it means you could go from one city to another and find a little bit different org structure. And in one case, you'd be looking for something within a particular department. It's not in that department within this new city. And we know that a lot of people are kind of in flux right now, moving to new cities, moving to new areas. And so they're trying to find information. It can be difficult to find that. But Public Works is still one of the kind of top most visited pages. And because a lot of information is housed within this area, you're going to find a ton of stuff. But we don't know what's happening after they get in to Public Works. Because it's kind of this black box again, where we know that they're getting there. We know this has important information, enough so that it's generating huge amounts of traffic. But we don't know what happens after that. And the feedback we've seen, just more along the lines of projects. People want to know what's happening, uh, where is it happening, when is it happening, just trying to get that information. So the other big analytics piece, as we mentioned before with events, we're getting that through from intercept surveys, but then we're also seeing it within the analytics. So it's nice that some of these things are kind of coming together. But people are finding calendars within site and then they're asking questions and they're hitting these with a lot of regularity. Again, we see this correlate more with Parks and Rec. So if there's a Parks and Rec department, we will see there be more interest in events. If there's not a Parks and Rec department, we will see a decrease in interest in events. And I keep saying black box over and over again, but maps is like our nemesis. Because all we know is that it goes into the Esri Arc GIS world and then we don't know what happens. We know that people are accessing maps a lot and they're finding information, but we don't know how usable it is. We don't get really feedback about their experience with maps because since we go into this third party side, it means we can't ask the questions that we normally ask. So the tool that we use that kind of pops up and says, hey, did you find it? Um, what were you looking for today? We lose all of that. So this is this whole world where we're seeing, I mean, this is top 10 among, across a lot of sites, maps, consistently maps. So if Parks and Rec is part of it, we will see this within the top 10 without fail. But it makes complete and perfect sense. Not as exciting for you guys, I know. So people are trying to pay bills. Most of the time, if you have any sort of requirement for payment that has to be made, and it has to be made through the site, this is why they're there. This is all they want to do. They really just want to speed that up and kind of get going through. A lot of time they're on auto pay, and the only reason they're there is because something went wrong. So they're trying to figure out what happened that this didn't work. But again, if there's anything related to bill pay, we will see that as being one of the, the top ones. But one of the big ones that we see, so a lot of people are just, they're getting confused. They don't know where they're supposed to go within the site. They have a rough idea. They don't know department names. They're trying to learn them, but they're kind of navigating through and they're clicking in what they think is the right spot. And so we know that if they click the right thing the first time, it dramatically increases the chance that they're going to get to the thing they're trying to find. So we want to get that first click right. So that's our, our goal when we're looking at navigation. How do we get the first click right? So how do we get them to match that? So we know what people are doing. We've got sense their behavioral data with analytics. But the other question is, what are people not doing? So what are they not trying to find on the site? What don't they care about? And one of these, because we've never had feedback about this, we've never had anyone say, I'm just looking at pictures of electeds. <laughs> and, and don't think that this is like a, some sort of war for me. It just sometimes gets frustrating because we'll, we'll meet with an elected, we'll explain what we're doing and research we're conducting, talk, talking to people in the community. And I think it's just the very nature of how the process works. But sometimes they can be a little bit more aggressive in, in wanting their personal interest maybe put up there rather than some of the interests of 
would help just kind of everyone within the community. Like, just make it easier to pay the bill. Make it easier to do these things, and people will be much more satisfied overall. So we know they're not doing that. What else are they not doing? <laughs> we know they're not reading content because they fill out the survey that says they couldn't find the thing they were looking for, and it was on the page. So I know for a fact that people are not reading through content. It kind of scares me to think of what content needs to start looking like, because I think we might have to bring back the blink tag and just have things just big and bold and only 10 words per page. We're going to have to set some really weird rules in the future. But we don't find people reading content. And it can be really frustrating um, from the standpoint of you've created something that explains what's happening. And we'll find people just hit the top. They look for just H1s, H2s, H3s. And then they'll just scroll. Like just hit the scroll wheel and just poof, just go right to the bottom. And so they've gotten, I don't know, it kind of amazes me because people have gotten so fast with scrolling and scanning content. If you look at the amount of, like, look at the average time on page sometime and see how long people are actually spending looking at given sections of site. And it's just, because uh, you can't actually comprehend information in that short period of time. So they're going, they're just looking for keywords. And this is important to know because if you're looking at trying to improve a page, redesign it, know that we're skew, keyword scanning animals. We're just looking for the thing that we think matches, and then we'll go down that rabbit hole. So it means that if you have a page that just has a lot of content, most of it isn't going to be read. And you can put, there's all sorts of free tools out there. You can put heat maps up. You can do kind of these recordings that will show you how people are actually clicking and interacting. But it's really interesting when you look at those kind of heat maps and then see how far down a page they're scrolling, what they're interacting with. We've just started moving the kind of the buttons and the big things, which make them big, put them at the top of the page, and then try to lead them in. We do this model called bite snack meal. We figure if they want to read the content, they're interested, let's give them a small taste of it, say, okay, here you go, here's a bite, and let's get them a little bit further. And then if they want to read everything and get really in depth, we provide that for them. So by no means should we take away the information, just we need to kind of restructure it and streamline it. I mean, just think though that like, Oh God, I'm thinking about my kids someday who are really young and how they're going to interact with the internet and then they're the future. God, no one's going to read. We'll be done. Okay, anyways. So this is the, the big question. So how do we fix these things? So I'm going to share a couple things that we've started doing that have helped with this. And hopefully you guys can, can find ways to, to integrate some of these. So one of the biggest things is organize content and navigation by topic. And don't let departments or whatever else say, well, it's called the same thing. You're both doing licensing, but we should have two different sections for licensing. No, that's completely confusing. Have a link for licensing and then just route out to the two different places. But this can be difficult, right? Because what are the topics? What should the topics be? And so what I would recommend is you can easily get a group of people together, kind of people who are local, and have them do a card sort. Now, card sorts, you just give them a list of words or topics and then say, how would you group these and what would you name those groups? But start with small amounts. Start with like 10 cards because people will start going crazy with those things. And it's a really rough guess. It's a really rough way of getting that information because People will name things. People can come up with lots of different names for the same thing. And people will also recognize a lot of different words for that thing. So if you give them licensing, they will find that. But if you give them kind of a whole other way of grouping that, they'll find a new way to group it. The other thing is, when we've got these topic hubs, we generally turn these then into pages. So this is a topic hub page. And so this hub page is for this particular topic or this particular thing. And then we have a list of action items. So what are the things that you can accomplish? What things can you learn or do that are based on this topic here? We also have some sort of contact information right available at the top. So if they know that they're not going to find the thing or they're frustrated, we give them an easy out so that they can pick up the phone or send an email. 
but we've got those action-based kind of section. We've got all of the related topics within there, and then we also have any subtopics. So that way, the goal is that you land on that page, and we wanted to get that kind of rough cut right first. So we know, again, if they're hitting that first thing in navigation, that they've got a way better chance of finding it. So we want to give them a page that has those related items, has similar items, it has the action-based items, and we can try to get them then right to the right spot. So this follows what's called a hub and spoke model of information architecture, and that's the goal. You get them to the hub, and then we want to send them down to the detailed spoke. But the idea is that we can collect them at the level of a topic that they understand. We also usually provide just links or information about the different departments that are mentioned or provide information on that page. That way if they know or recognize that department, they can then go down that path directly instead. The other big thing is answering this question of, of how do I? And what we found is a lot of times sites are just not good at this. So we talked before about this model of perpetual intermediates. And people will come in, and even if you're an intermediate, sometimes you have to relearn how you did something. Or people may be moving in and they don't know how to go about kind of a certain process. Like the bane of, I think, every city county that we've ever seen is related to trash, recycling, and all of this. It is, no one has like hit this out of the park. If you find it, I'd love to see it, because we always find confusion with, can I recycle this? And the number of times we've seen that come up, it just comes up repeatedly. And some of the best ways that I've seen handling this, um, so City of Boston has done a really great job with some of their build out of the new site. And one of the things that we thought was really compelling about what they put together, and I guess the previous speaker was, I think was on that project, and I guess she's, she was here earlier, but they have really great sections on how do I. So they laid these out as step-by-step -step templates, and it makes it simple to know how to get a parking permit or what you need to do related to filing for other types of permits or for what can be recycled. So they structured it as this how do I, and these how-tos are just really great. Um, another kind of companion of that that they put together were these guide sections. So if it's a more complex topic dealing with a bunch of different things, there would be this longer guide that would detail out all of the information related to that and then segment it within to audience groupings. And so we found those to be really compelling and they also test really well. So the other thing that I think needs to get brought in is a lot of times there are really cool projects and programs happening and no one seems to showcase them. It's kind of this surprise because if people knew the cool things would happen, they would be excited about them. But we see that there's all these projects and the projects are just kind of buried deep within somewhere. Sometimes it's within public works. Um, a lot of programs just seem to get buried and you can't easily find out what's happening. And it gets frustrating from the standpoint of, you know, if work within a city or a county or government, you see, you know these cool initiatives are, are occurring. You're seeing them happen. But no one in the public knows that they're happening. And they're just not promoted as well. They're not showcased as well. We normally don't take care of them from a visual standpoint. So we don't do a good job of telling that story and saying, hey, look at what we've done. This Project has been completed over the course of two years. Here's a timeline for the project. Here are pictures of the project. Here's what we accomplished through this. And I think this all gets kind of tucked away. I know there's a lot of modesty that gets kind of thrown out too, but we should showcase the things that are happening. We should talk about programs. And one thing that we like to see is when we're doing some of these hub pages, some of the how do I's, so we recommend having that information. It's supporting content. Don't have it be necessarily the main thing, but have it be supporting content. Be able to showcase what's happening and relate it on other pages. Because a lot of these projects affect things that are related to news. Some of the projects will reflect things related to a how do I or a guide. And really you've got this giant hub of content where everything is related to one another. But we do a really bad job and we just kind of silo it all away. So you can never get a really holistic understanding of what's happening within a given program or project, the latest news and any events occurring with it.
and this goes to that point around guides. If we're looking at people as perpetual intermediates, it means that we have to be educating them. We need to be bringing them along the path and saying, hey, here are the things that you need to know about this to kind of reach a little bit more competency or understanding within this field. And so it's our job to help educate. It's our job to explain the programs, let them know what's happening, and help them understand it so that they can become advocates too and understand the cool things that are kind of right beneath their feet that they don't even know about. And this is the really hard one I know, because I know there's been another session on, on plain language, but it's really important. Keep in mind when you're reading something, you're looking at it, are you using a normal language? Are you using plain language? Are you referencing things that sound more like someone who works in the field? And this is really difficult. I mean, everyone who works professionally in a field that has specific language, and every field does, suffers from this because I, I will go into meetings and I know now from kind of user experience land, sometimes things I say they kind of look at me like I'm from outer space because we start using, you know, different phrases or different letters that stand for things and it just doesn't make sense. And so I'm saying this as someone who is advocating for plain language. It, this is really difficult and the way that you do it is you have other people proofread. You have people proofread who are not in your department. You have people proofread who don't work within government and you say, hey, can you, what is this about? You know, what, what did we communicate with this? And again, this is extraordinarily difficult, but you can also run it through some reading checkers too and just see what is the reading level of this and how difficult is this to understand overall. And so I talk really fast, so it means that I've hit my last slide, but I would love to, to answer questions or kind of Get some more feedback from you guys from what you've seen. Yeah, in the back, sorry. Um, do you have examples of some websites for the topic page? Yes, I do. Um, get with me after. So, I'm trying to think of some good ones. So, there's a couple, because I don't want to just include sites that I've worked on. I think that's not okay. Um, so, some of the ones that we've seen, King County, um, and Washington State has, a, has done a good job of breaking those out. And uh, the funny thing is, I, I think this is interesting, I'll just tell you real quick. Someone else came up with the Topic Hub model in Las Vegas. So someone working for the city of Las Vegas came up with this. But then I don't know what happened along the way, but that knowledge was lost and kind of disappeared. But they came up with this and it was published in usability magazines for government web professionals like years ago. So it's a really great model, but we, we kind of have short memories within the web, kind of forget. Um, so King County is one, and then let me think of some of those. Um, we did topic models for um, my TPU, MYTPU, and that's .org, mytpu.org. So you can see some topic model pages within there. I'm trying to think of other good ones, because we've worked on a couple topic models, but the sites haven't launched. So those two will give you, because King County, they did a really good job. Um, you'll be able to see those. And then TPU, the navigation is not my best work. I won't say that it is, but like I said earlier, we get into things with department directors. Sometimes they feel very strongly about navigation, even when you test it with hundreds of people and say, hey, this might work better. So I would look at those two, and that'll give you a real, really good sense of just how we broke apart those pieces. And I can provide details too about how we do the work, if it would help for how we kind of segment pages into those different pieces for structure. People don't want to be lost on the site. So I would put it more like that. So people don't want to always be learning. They would rather be at the intermediate level 
they want to be moved up that curve. But because of the nature of government sites, they kind of sometimes stay on the beginner side. And part of the perpetual intermediate, too, is we should be looking at this more from, so if we step outside of the website a little bit, we want to move people up to intermediates related to how they understand government. And this is kind of my thing on civics lessons. Normally when people start understanding something, they go, oh, this is cool. Like They get excited about learning. But we're in this weird spot of, because my utility bill, I don't go on the site, it's on auto pay. And so I don't know where things are, but I don't like the feeling of being lost. I would rather move up to some sort of competency, even if it's a little bit, to know where the thing is. But then we hit this interesting learning piece where people retain knowledge. And so when we do usability testing, we have to kind of counter this learning bias. So we've got to make sure that it's a, like a fresh user who's never seen the thing. And for government sites, they're seeing the thing one time and then they're waiting three months. And so anything they knew about it, they've forgotten. But this is generally more of a kind of interaction design. Like, so Alan Cooper is, is his name. He's one of the kind of the forefathers of user experience. But this is the model that they developed early on where they know that people want to move up the scale, but it doesn't mean that they are necessarily moving up the scale. Yeah, and that's, this is one of the really difficult tasks. If you only have someone accessing for one reason whatsoever, it means that, and they're accessing infrequently, you've basically added up all the things that you need to make sure that they never learn. Yeah, so we've done testing on wizards, um, and it sounds really funny. Um, we've tested lots of wizards, <laughs> assess their skill. I'm distracted just thinking about chatbots because people are really mean to chatbots, and for some reason they're willing, because of the anonymity of the internet, we found that the things that people say to us in surveys where it's longer form compared to what they say when it's like a small little window, like they say some very hurtful things. Um, and so chatbots do have some success, but it depends on a couple factors. So one, is the chatbot like IA like, or AI, do you have some sort of thing powering it? Or is there actually a person on the other end? If it's a person, it, it's way easier. The problem is getting any level of AI related to what's happening and being able to give them the auto kind of, oh, you should look for this thing or you should look for that thing. People get frustrated quickly with that, and they oftentimes they just want to talk to a human. Um, if you have really good AI, if you can power the thing, then it, it's helpful. And then, because this is what, I mean, Amazon's been doing this for years. What they've figured out is how do we classify information rapidly? And Joe, my coworker here, is a data scientist, can explain all of this. But they figure out then how to have you classify, oh, I had a problem with this. What was the problem? Pick from one of these eight things. And so they've built this classification system up over time. And it's unique and it's special to Amazon. And it gets you most of the way there. But to get to that point is a lot of work. It takes a lot of time to train that model. And so I would say if it's a chat button, there's an actual human on the other end, that's a lot easier for people to handle. And a lot of times, when people are filling out the little survey we have, they think it's a chatbot, and they just want to ask questions. Because people are getting really accustomed to be having something available that they can quickly ask the question and then get some sort of response back. Is there any uh, like statistics after you apply these recommendations, like kind of what that success factor really is, and maybe any kind of analysis as far as now that we're in this model, here's what changed or here's what improved? Yeah, so we measured on two things. Um, one is time on task. So we want to see people spending less time to try to accomplish the task. And the other one is task success. So we'll also include task satisfaction in there. But we found that measuring task satisfaction over time, we kind of have hit this weird spot where everyone's like right around 4.5. We very rarely have people a lot less than that. <coughs> Only university students, because they just hate everything, I swear. Um, it's the only time we've really had low scores. But those are the three main measures that we do. So decreased time on task, 
we want to see task completion rates go up. And then we keep the feedback collectors going because we want to see after recommendations were made, do we get better feedback over time? And we want to see more people saying yes. And so that's the, because if we don't, that means we didn't do our job. And it's also, for us, it's transparency. Because if we can say, hey, this is working better, we have the same feedback collector asking the same question on the same page, but now it's redesigned. And if it doesn't go up, then we can ask some harder questions and say, okay, what's happening on this individual page? The other thing to note, and everyone should just remember this, when you do a new design and you launch the thing, people will dislike it immediately. You'll see a drop off, and then you'll see a bump up. Because we had one site a couple months ago that we launched, and actually had higher kind of satisfaction ratings. But of course, when we launched, we saw a drop, and now it's trended back up again. But you will have that, because people get accustomed to things, and they don't like it when you move things on them. Other questions? So residents, business, those are audience buckets. And what we found, because we for a year or two, because we really thought that the residents, business, that style was going to work. But what we've found over time is people sometimes don't know which bucket they fall into. And when they don't know what bucket they fall into, they don't know where to go. So what we've done is we will add a menu item like services. And then that's what we'll, where we'll put all the topics. And so we call them more, like this is our service hub. But I, it's because it's the, the information architecture pattern is a topic-based pattern. But we'll use just the title services. And then we'll see how people interact with that. And the way that we've tested this over time is we do what's called tree testing. We just have the words and the menu items. And it doesn't really have, it's just kind of this list. When you click on one, it'll expand out and show you the sub items. If you click on one of the sub-items, it'll show you those sub-items. So we can see how people traverse through the information. And we found that services test well. But there's also the kind of this relation between how many items do you have and then which item are they going to click. I mean, if you only have two items, you cut down on choice pretty quickly. As soon as you start expanding that list out, you've got 12, 15 items. It's going to take longer for a user to scan those items and try to find the right one and then increase the chance that they click on the wrong one. So we use something called Hotjar. And so we, we found out about it originally through City of Philadelphia study that they were doing. So years and years ago. And we've been using them for a while. But they'll also allow because it's really easy to set up with Google Tag Manager. And it's just kind of a one click thing. Or you can just drop the JavaScript code just right on the site. But you can run heat maps, you can run recording, you can run polls, and it'll allow you to collect a whole bunch of really valuable information. Yeah, so we put it on, on every page. The only frustrating thing that we've had is <coughs> with any of the intercept surveys, they pop up, right? Because the easy way to install them is they're overlaid onto the page. And people, I don't blame them, like they don't like that all the time. But every page is a little bit different depending on how it's built. Because what we really prefer is if it's possible to just embed it into the actual page. So you can have it within the context of the page. Was this page helpful? Yes or no? And then capture that data. But that requires building something custom. You'll notice that Google does that a lot. And a lot of other kind of companies that have a lot of content rich, they'll provide that on their help pages to see if you could find it. We found that that model is a little bit more effective. We cut down on the chatter of people who are angry at the pop-up. 
but we get a lot less feedback. Our feedback drops off a ton because although the pop-up is more annoying, it gets a lot more people responding. And so we target in such a way, because Hotjar will allow you to set it so that as someone's mouse, as the cursor is moving to exit the page, that's when you can pop it up. You can do a delay on it. So we try to set it so that it doesn't immediately jump up, because if it immediately jumps up, then we didn't give them time to actually look through the page and see if they could find the thing on their own. And so we've seen results. If you pop it up immediately, you'll get more no's because people haven't even had a chance and they can't really change their answer. Bless you. Other questions? Well, I'll be here till Friday. You guys can hunt me down if you have another question. But thank you guys so much for attending. I appreciate it.